A weekend at the cottage is a feast for the senses. There's the dappled sunlight reflecting off the lake, the tickle of cool water on dangling feet, and the smell of freshly brewed coffee while my family is still sleeping. But some of my favorite things about the cottage are the sounds. The loons at dusk, the lazy waves lapping at the dock, the crackle of a campfire. Then again, there's one cottage sound that drives me batty. It's the annoying hum of the mosquitoes when I'm trying to savor that last moment of the sunset. Luckily, off family care deep free keeps the mozzies at bay. It works for up to five hours, it isn't greasy or oily like some other repellents, and it's safe for the whole family aged six months and up. So I can savor the sounds I love when I'm at the lake. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly, Editor-in-Chief of Cottage Life magazine. In this episode of the Cottage Life podcast, it's tree time. We play tree trivia with a master arborist, learn about the surprising ways that our favorite gentle giants communicate, and we revisit an essay on how planting trees can grow much more than a forest. This is the Cottage Life podcast, where every day is the weekend. years, we've had hundreds of questions about trees come into our magazine's popular Q&A column. Cottagers love their trees, but oftentimes they don't pay too much attention to the health of the trees until there's a problem with one of them. And then it's often too late. So we wanted to take some time to talk about trees and how we can care for them. Matt Logan, along with his wife, Tracy Logan, is the owner and operator of Logan Tree Experts based in the Kawarthas area of Ontario. He is a board-certified master arborist, which is the highest level of arborist certification under the International Society of Arboriculture. Matt is joining me to answer some of the most commonly asked questions about trees from cottagers. Hi, Matt. Hi, Michelle. So I thought I would start by asking you, before we got into the specifics of tree care at the cottage, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do in cottage country? We run a full-service tree care company. So that goes everywhere from um, consultations, uh, reports, to some of the more obvious tree work that people consider, which would be tree removal, tree pruning, uh, tree planting, um, installing support cables to uh, try to help um, structurally compromised trees. I was thinking that maybe I would ask you a couple of questions today. And these are the questions that people are always asking us at the magazine. And I'm going to try and stump you. That, that's my little joke for the day. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so the first question is, some animal has stripped the bark off several of our birch trees along the shoreline. They are each more than 20 centimeters in diameter. So we thought that they would be safe from beavers. Could it be that another animal chewed it? What say you, Matt? I've seen beavers take on trees that are several feet across. Um, So, and birch trees are definitely a favorite on the menu for beavers. So it's it's most likely a beaver. Uh, The size of the tree really doesn't matter. Beavers have to chew. It's what they do. And if there's not a smaller tree nearby, they're going to go for a bigger one. They they have one heck of a work ethic. Mm-hmm. Uh, simple fix, uh, get some heavy gauge chicken wire to put around it, and, and they're just going to find something more convenient. So deter them, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I've also heard uh, that a possible solution is stovepipe, but I kind of wonder if that might do more harm than good to the tree. Is there anything to that? Yeah, that's something that I've seen as well. And the idea behind it is you have a a complete cylinder barrier to keep pests away. And sometimes it's not beavers. Sometimes it's rabbits that can chew the bark. The problem with that solid cylinder is it doesn't let the airflow that mesh or cage does. And the tree needs that airflow. If you have a, say, a stovepipe, one, it's black. So that can create heat within that pipe and that can do significant damage to the bark. And it can also, it slows the bark down from maturing properly and hardening off. So what happens is you have really supple, soft bark, which is a lot easier for mice and vermin and rabbits and things to uh, to chew away at and strip. 
And the other thing is you can create a really good habitat for uh, insects. So that's one of the reasons why I recommend like a solid cage or chicken wire, because it's going to allow the airflow to get through, but it, it's still going to let the, the, the tree breathe. Right. So it sounds like that's a pretty straightforward solution. The, the answer is chicken wire. Yep. And, and make sure that you're allowing room to grow. And the other big one is make sure it's high enough because what I see every spring is chicken wire that was under snow and the rabbits were on top of the snow. So they just chewed above the chicken wire. Right. So you want to make sure that that chicken wire goes nice and high too. So how many feet would you say? Well, it really depends on what your typical snow load is in your particular area. All right. So the next question is actually somewhat related to what you're saying. And this is another question we get all the time. My husband and I want to hang a hammock at our cottage and are debating on how to do it. Is it better for the tree if we put a small hook into the trunk or use a rope around the trunk to hang the hammock? So nail or rope, what's the final answer? <laughs> That's the age-old question of cottaging. Yeah, how, how sure do you, it's, it's either how do you take care of the hammock or how do you take care of the clothesline? Yes. You, you don't mess with those things. That's right. The clothesline, that's ex- exactly the same problem, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the answer is use the small hook. Okay. Use the hook, uh, drill it in to the tree because what you're doing is you're creating a small wound given the whole circumference of the tree. But when you wrap the rope around, you're, you have the ability of girdling the tree. And then, so then you're choking off the tree and you can create damage to the entire tree instead of that little hole where the bolt or the screw goes. Right. Because I've noticed this in the city where you'll see an old bike locked up to uh, a tree or something and the tree actually grows around the bike. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that takes, that takes a lot of energy. You need to remember that the, the vascular system, uh, the circulatory system of the tree is all kind of on the outside. Mm-hmm. So when you damage the bark or when you girdle the bark and you choke that off, it's really stopping the movement of sugars and nutrients and water up and down the tree. So you, you want to make sure to never impede that, that process. And that's what wrapping, uh, wrapping it around does. And, and the only way to get around that is that every time you're done with your hammock, you take the rope off and not too many people are going to really do that. Okay. That's a pretty straightforward answer. This one I suspect may not be as straightforward. So here's the question. A tall tree on my property was hit by lightning. It's close to the bunkie and I'm worried that it might fall. Do I need to cut it down? <laughs> You're right. That isn't a straightforward one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a lot of factors there that, that are not included in the question. Am I right? There, there are. When it comes to lightning, it can do so many different variable amounts of damage to a tree. It's really hard. You can't just have a blanket statement that if a tree gets hit by lightning, it has to come down. Or if a tree gets hit by lightning, it should be okay. Right. And we, we work with a lot of storm damage and lightning struck trees. And every time everything's different because your water content in the tree is different. Um, what it's grounding out. So what is coming down into the soil, what kind of the soil moisture, the soil composition, everything changes. Did it jump to a building? So an arborist can come and take a look at that and say, okay, this is what I think given my experience and my knowledge, this is what I think is going on with this tree, given this type of damage. If it came on the outside, has it blown the a branch off? There's all those things to consider. And then you start looking at your risk assessment. So we've already said that this tree is right beside a bunkie. Okay, so now we have a target. So if this tree were to fail, there's a good chance it could hit something. Then we start looking at, well, what's the consequences if it were to hit this? Would would the 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 whole building be damaged? Would it be destroyed? Um, If it's a small 30-foot tree, 
probably not. But if it's an 80 foot tree, there's a potential of that. Right. So I think I think the important thing here, though, and what you're saying is that if if the tree has been hit by lightning, it does doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, you have to cut it down. Tr- many trees can survive a lightning strike. Yes. And, and trees do. And you can see this in pines where uh, the top gets blown out by lightning and then the tree finds different leaders and it continues to grow. Now, that being said, now that damage the damage that has been done may never be repaired because trees don't really work that way. But one of the big things is what is the homeowner or the cottage owner's risk tolerances? And that's something that a certified arborist can't bring to the table because it's your property. Right. It's really their decision if they're willing or able to take on the the risk of having this compromised tree. Right. Yeah. I mean, we always say at the magazine that if the tree is um, in danger of falling on a path or a person or a building, then that's when you really have to think about cutting it down. But if it's back in the forest, it doesn't matter. That The next question I'm going to ask is, is similarly difficult to answer, I think, in some ways, but I'm going to lob it at you anyway. Okay. Someone asked, how do I protect my trees from blight and other infestations? What are some of the most likely predators for my healthy trees? So I think here, I mean, there's so many things that can affect your trees in terms of blight and infestations. But perhaps maybe we just focus on what you think is the most common one and if there is a way to protect your trees against it. Most issues that we have with trees is what I like to call accumulative stress. There's just, there's a whole bunch of little things that that can go wrong with trees and what i when i go on site most people say what's wrong with my tree and they're they're often looking for the silver bullet the thing but i what i try to explain to them is it's more like silver lead shot there's just a whole bunch of little things that are stressing your tree and overall bringing down the vigor so uh, some of those accumulative stress that we're seeing right now are we're getting lots of droughts, we're getting extreme heat. Um, and, and what that does is then the tree isn't taking up as much water, it's releasing a ton of water uh, through transpiration, and it's just decreasing the vigor, which makes it more susceptible. And, and there's research that shows that when trees are under stress, they can release pheromones that insects can pick up on. Isn't that incredible how this would be a whole other conversation about the things that trees can do that we don't know? And that's one of them for sure. Okay, so you've just touched on actually the thing that's in the next question. And I think I know the answer to maybe I'll try to answer this one. And then and then you can tell me if I'm right. (laughs) Okay. Okay. so the, the next question, the last question is, I want to plant some trees at my cottage. How do I do this to get the best results? What kind of tree do I plant? Okay, so if I was to answer this question, which I've had before, I would say something um, about going into the forest and looking at the soil and looking at the trees. Because I know that if you look at a tree in the forest and you see a tree that's native to your property and to your area and to your soil condition and to your weather condition, that's the kind of tree that you should plant on your property because that's the tree that's going to have the strongest uh, chance of survival. Is that right? Absolutely. Yep. Look around. (laughs) Yay. Okay, great. If the master arborist tells me it's right, I'm very happy about it. (laughs) Yeah, no, you you absolutely... Don't try to bring in something that isn't used to that zone, isn't used to those uh, those soil conditions. Um, you want to try to replicate that as much as possible. And and even when you're planting on your cottage property, consider planting in groups instead of just an individual tree. Okay, so how many would be in a group? Well, anything more than one. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So multiples, two, three, as many as you can. Certainly the the more, the more you can, the better, because then they're going to grow above ground and below ground as a community. Now, if, if you just want that singular tree, which a lot of people do because they don't want their whole lawn taken up, um, consider planting a bed around the tree. 
And then that way, all those plants that are growing around the base, be it perennials, annuals, hopefully natives, um, all those are going to alleviate compaction, uh, moderate temperature. They're going to add to the soil environment with um, different invertebrates and things like that. What we always recommend and an easier thing to do so you don't have to mow your lawn all weekend, every weekend, is just get rid of it. Put in more trees, put in more plants, let, get rid of your lawn. That will help the forest thrive more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. That is awesome. So I guess um, I can call myself a budding arborist. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. There's so many tree jokes I, to be made. Yeah, I, I knew there I knew there wasn't going to be just one. <laughs> I would, I would, I, I would go out on a limb and say you're a budding arborist. Ah, oh, bless! And you're the master arborist. I take that as a major compliment. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you so much for your help, Matt, and for telling us all this stuff about trees. I love talking trees, and I've learned a lot from you just in this short time. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. It was fun. So we all know that awesome sound of the wind moving through the trees. It's one of the most relaxing sounds of summer. Our resident Mother Nature is here to demystify these sounds we hear when we're at the cottage. Liam Bobechko is a longtime Cottage Life editor and self-described nature nerd. What have you got for us today? Well, a couple of things. First up, scientists have known for some time that trees talk to each other. One of the ways they do this is by emitting naturally produced chemicals into the air to warn others of impending danger. Who would have known that? That is so cool. And another way they talk, so to speak, is through underground networks between tree roots called mycorrhiza. I'm sorry, say that word again. Mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza. Okay, so how does that work? The work of Suzanne Simard, an ecologist at UBC, and her colleagues has revealed that trees have a symbiotic relationship with these underground fungal networks. The fungi, which can't photosynthesize, get food that's made by the trees. The trees get help moving nutrients and water back and forth to each other through the fungal network. And they're doing this not only between trees of the same species, but with other species as well. So I find this interesting because from the little bit that I know about trees, I know that typically they compete for light and for space and for resources in a crowded forest. So I'm sort of surprised to learn that they cooperate in such a sophisticated way. Why do they do this? You're not wrong. They do compete. But there's also a benefit in cooperating, in doing things like sharing nutrients between tree species at different times of the year. For instance, Samard's group studied what happens in BC forests with birch and Douglas fir growing together. During the summer, the birch trees are in full leaf and they're photosynthesizing like crazy, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Meanwhile, if the Douglas fir is getting shaded out, it's doing less photosynthesizing, so it could use a hand in the carbon department. And here's the amazing part. The carbon moves from the birch to the fur through the mycorrhizal root network. Wow, it seems so sophisticated to me. It's incredible. But wait, there's more. In the fall, birch trees lose their leaves, right? And the fur, because it's an evergreen, doesn't. And so, voila, the carbon moves the other way. It's like tree karma, payback time. So cool. <laughs> I know. And it's not just carbon that's moving along this pipeline. They're sending other nutrients and signals between them. They're communicating their needs, sending warning signals about environmental change, detecting relatives, and even giving away their resources when they're dying. But as fascinating as both those are, they're not something we can hear, which leads us to the second thing. It turns out that trees actually do make other sounds and that scientists are starting to figure out how to understand them. Cool. What kind of other sounds? Well, according to research by scientists out of Grenoble University in France, trees make tiny ultrasonic sounds that researchers can pick up with sensitive microphones. I bet you can pick it up, too, because you are Mother Nature, right? <laughs> I wish. No. <laughs> what do they tell you the trees are saying? They're saying, I'm thirsty. I'm really, really thirsty. The trees make these sounds when they're in extreme dry conditions. Oh, okay. So can we hear that sound maybe on tape? The sound is super high frequency, too high for human ears to hear. But I have a clip here pulled from a video made by the researchers, and they lowered the pitch so that our ears can hear it. Wow. 
Whoa, okay. So that is the sound that tells us the tree is really dry and thirsty. Exactly. And being able to listen in on this gives us insight into what's happening inside the tree. That really is so neat. Honestly, trees never fail to amaze me. They're incredible. So if we were to just go back to where we started when we talked about the sound of the wind in the treetops, I was just thinking it'd be so cool if you could identify what kind of tree you're hearing just by the sound that the leaves make when the wind passes through. Well, it turns out that biologist George David Haskell wondered the same thing. He talks about the distinct voices of different trees, how the stiffness, shape, and thickness of the leaves and the architecture of the branches all affect how they sound in the wind. He describes a balsam fir tree in northern Ontario as, quote, like fine steel wool burnishing a tabletop, a sound that is strong, corrosive, but with a soft bite, end quote. That actually sounds like poetry. I know, doesn't it? It makes me want to go lie down under different trees and see if I can get to know their sounds by ear. I wouldn't put it past you that you could achieve just that. (laughs) It's kind of like what the painter Bob Ross said. There's nothing wrong with having a tree as a friend, right? Right. I think you could do worse. Thanks so much, Leanne. Thanks, Michelle. I've been going to the cottage my whole life, I still haven't quite nailed my weekend packing routine. Whether it's forgetting to freeze the ice packs ahead of time or playing luggage Tetris with my vehicle, I always wish it were a smoother process. And the worst is when I'm heading north in long weekend traffic with a sinking feeling that I've forgotten something. With mosquito season upon us, one thing you don't want to forget is off Family Care Smooth and Dry Repellent. It repels mosquitoes for up to five hours, and it goes on as a smooth powder instead of an oily, greasy film. Make it a part of your packing routine, or better yet, keep extra at the cottage so you'll have one less thing to forget. Leanne Bobechko, who you just heard talking about trees, is our longtime deputy editor. In the summer 2017 issue of Cottage Life, celebrating Canada's 150th birthday, Leanne wrote about how planting a tree in the ground means growing more than a little greenery. The Long View is read by Garvia Bailey. Time is a funny thing. When I was a kid, anything that happened before I was born seemed to be from another century, in a category called the past, which held not only world wars and former prime ministers, but also weird old hats from the 50s in the cottage closets and obsolete items in the shed, such as the two-man cross-cut saw, the corrugated glass washboard, and the rusted-out tobacco tins. Certainly, the 1967 centennial, about which the grown-ups sometimes reminisced, seemed unreachable, perhaps because it took place more than 10 years, imagine, before I was born. Or perhaps because it was an event that itself looked back even further into the past. Maybe that's what gave the map such appeal. Growing up, we would occasionally pull out of a drawer in the dining room a hand-drawn map that showed our cottage and the clearing nearby. Like any good treasure map, It was a link to another place or time. In this case, that summer in 67, when Canadians were encouraged to take on a centennial project. My grandparents wanted to do something and decided that their project would entail, over that summer, planting 100 trees at the cottage. They recorded each tree that went in the ground on the map, sometimes with the name of the family member or cottage guest who had planted it sometimes just with an X, and noted the tree species. Many of those people, including my grandparents, are no longer living. But in each case, they have a tree that lives on, recalling the day that it was placed in its new home. Unlike on a pirate's map, however, where the prize is hidden, this treasure was one you could walk up to, sit under, chase your cousins around, Mostly white spruce, but also balsam fir, 
a couple of white pines, and one or two tamarack. These saplings were added to the forest, reclaiming a little bit of the clearing that was once upon a time a working field. Using the existing forest as a guide, my family chose trees that were native not only to the area, but to the property. I like to think that planting the trees for the centennial was an expression of the love my grandparents had for the place, especially the forest, and how much they wanted to share that love with us. That while they were celebrating the past, they were also looking to the future and imagining their grandchildren walking the same forest with their children. I don't need to tell cottagers the value of trees. Most of us have a tree that forms a key piece of our cabin experience, be it part of our favorite view, a landmark on the drive, or one that we've spent hours under, summer after summer, watching life unfold in its branches. More than simply being beautiful, and simply beautiful they are, trees are understatedly useful. These long-term friends provide a weapon in the increasingly critical battle against climate change by storing carbon dioxide. They give shade for fish and the cool understory. They make habitat for wildlife, clean the air and the water, and stabilize the soil, all the while giving you a place to hang your hammock. When in the company of trees, I'm often reminded of the ants, the tree-like beings in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. They're a usually gentle, but sometimes crotchety bunch who, because of their long lives, have a different sense of time. They make decisions slowly, with much reasoning and deliberation, and seem mystified by the rash action and scurrying around of the less-rooted peoples around them. Canada's non-fictional trees can live a very long time, some species for up to 2,000 years. There's a subalpine larch in Kananaskis, Alberta, that's thought to be 1,943 years old, and a Nootka cypress on Vancouver Island that's 1,636. And while the trees growing beside your cabin are probably not as old as those, it's not unthinkable that they could live for 100, even 200 years. These slow-growing giants must surely take the long view. It's a perspective we can borrow to slow down and to plan thoughtfully and with foresight to redefine the meaning of cottage time. My uncle tells me that for the first year or two, he would water the young trees once in a while, keeping an eye on them during those critical years. In the summers that followed, he went back and planted replacements for the two trees that didn't survive. A forest is not just a destination to soothe your soul or where you can learn about the place you stand. It's a living process and a physical embodiment of hope for the future. All living things will grow and eventually die. In the meantime, we can try to leave something meaningful behind. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive up to the cottage. The award-winning Cottage Life magazine has great tips and inspiration for cottage living. We have a special subscription deal for podcast listeners, including a bonus issue and a free gift. Go to cottagelife.com slash pod for details. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me, Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock. This podcast is funded in part by the Government of Canada.